But, um, you know, I got uh, interested in conjoining twins uh, early in my career, started reading a lot about them, trying to figure out why the neurosurgical interventions were so devastating, and concluded that it was examination of bleeding of that. And, um, you know, I was talking to, to Bruce Rice uh, about how they do the pediatric uh, cardiac surgeries, and he was telling me about the hypothermic arrest that he'd done some work with. And uh, lo and behold, a couple months later, here came these German doctors to present the case of the uh, Bender twins. And um, there you can see their mother, uh, Teresa, and the Bender twins themselves. Very extensive joining, occipital craniopathies. Such twins had never before been separated, but both surviving. And she had been told in Europe that she had to choose which twin to live, and uh, that they would just cleave whichever one she could want off. And she just couldn't make that choice. So they were looking for somebody who had a solution. And I started talking to them about you know, separating them and using hypothermic arrest at the appropriate time to be able to do the operation. And we started putting together a team here. It was an amazing team. Mark Rogers, uh, who was the chief of the pediatric anesthesia at that time, uh, was just masterful in orchestrating the way that it was all put together. And uh, there you can see the twins. Some of us actually went over to Germany uh, to look at them put in scalp expanders uh, so that we could have skin to cover over it. And uh, we discovered uh, some things that we weren't expecting. But for instance, uh, you see the vertebrals and the basal systems, how they actually join. And we were saying, well, how in the world can you separate that? Well, you know, that was a major risk we actually took when we separated when we put caps on and cut it. And, uh, but uh, there were some, some very substantial problems uh, that you can see the team uh, operating. We got into bleeding much earlier than we had anticipated. We only had one hour of hypothermic arrest time. Uh, and uh, we had to go on hypothermic arrest much sooner. And uh, that really changed things. But on hypothermic arrest, this is one of the venous sinuses. Normally, there's blood flow at a high rate. There's nothing there. Cold pulseless, plug operating on a cadaver, but operating extremely rapidly in order to get things reconstructed. And, uh, and Dr. Reitz and Dr. Kalen were actually looking over our shoulders and they were cutting out pieces of pericardium from the, from the heart that were just the right shapes for this, for various other things, so that we wouldn't have to waste time sewing them back together. We'd ask people, don't tell us what, how much time there is left because we didn't need the extra pressure. And uh, we finished at 59 minutes and some seconds. Uh, and um, as we started pumping the blood back in, uh, you can see there was a lot of hemorrhage. Things started swelling. Uh, it was really quite monstrous. But uh, in the long run, they did OK. You can see that they were not suffering nutritionally. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you know, a few years later, there was another similar case in South Africa. But they were very, very rapidly deteriorating. And, uh, you know, they summoned uh, if I could come over and help. We actually did exactly the same operation. Uh, but when we went in to put them in hypothermic arrest, discovered that one of the hearts was just not functioning. It was just fibrillating. And the other one was doing all the cardiac work. And that's the reason they were deteriorating so fast, because as they grew, the one heart could not do all the work. They were going into failure. So we got them separated. The one with the good heart actually was doing quite well uh, for the first couple of days and then started seizing and eventually died. And it turned out that that one had no kidneys. The other one had the kidneys. So you know, they were symbiotic in that sense. And it really points out the, the importance when you have twins of that nature to really study them uh, extremely carefully. And, uh, that's those. and then a few years later, there was another set. These were from Zambia, but they were going to be done at the Medical University of South Africa. I was a little worried about whether I should go back again, because I was still licking my wounds from the one before that, um, and saying, well, well, if I go back there again and get involved, and they fail, then I would have failed two out of three times. I don't know if my ego can take that. And then I said, wait a minute, it's not about your ego. It's about whether those 
kids can have a normal chance of life. And uh, I said, you should never, ever think a thought like that again. Because of all the gifts and talents that we have as physicians, we can never let ourselves be co-opted by ego and co-opted by peer pressure. And always remember that our first obligation is to the patient, no matter what the outcome. And But the interesting thing in studying these, you can see that this common circular sinus is in one phase of the venogram, not full. And that said to me that they probably had the propensity for developing collateral circulation relatively quickly. And that we could, in fact, separate them and cut through that circular sinus, which has always been the thing that has bugged people about that kind of surgery. There were 13 attempts to separate uh, type 2 vertical craniopathies, which these two were before without success. But uh, by, by concentrating on that area and doing the separation, and the other thing that was a tremendous advantage is we have a 3D workstation over an outpatient clinic. And I was actually able to drive through all the vessels and practice the operation before actually going over there. So I knew which vessels went to uh, which twin, an enormous advantage. And uh, after a 28-hour surgery, uh, they actually turned out quite well, and they're actually in the eighth grade uh, now. But uh, perhaps the, the one that gathered the most attention around the world was the Bijani twins. And, uh, you know, they were 28 years old, uh, women from Iran. Iran, their lifelong goal was to be separated. And they scoured the world looking for a team willing to do that. And when they first contacted me, I told them about Chang and Ian Bunker, the original Siamese twins. So uh, they ended up with a team in Singapore. And there was a team I had worked with uh, before on uh, some other twins. So somehow they managed to convince me to come and help them against my better judgment. But uh, when I saw those twins, I was just flabbergasted. They were full of personality. They were vivacious. They were smart. They learned to speak English in only seven months, if you can imagine that. They both had college degrees. They both had law degrees. Only one wanted one. They both had long degrees. <laughs> so, uh, they, they were incredibly intelligent. They understood, you know, the risk that they were taking. And they said something to me that really struck me. They said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck in that. And I realized, you know, putting myself in the shoes, what it must be like not to be able to get away from somebody for one second when you have different goals and aspirations. But that operation, we were about 90% finished, and some people were starting to celebrate, I was not among them. Because when we got to the very end of the operation, they began to bleed profusely, and it was such force, you couldn't stop it. And uh, they exsanguinated. But there were a lot of things that we were able to learn about adult circulation uh, in that. And these are just some of the models uh, that are used to help study the anatomy in these kinds of uh, twins. But, you know, this is the, the last case I want to mention. Uh, and these were, uh, again, twins from Germany, type 1 uh, craniopathies, Leah and Tabita Block. And the thing that was absolutely fantastic about this case is you know, I've come to the understanding that our neurosurgical department is the most talented neurosurgical department on the face of the earth. And everybody is extraordinary at something. So we actually put together a team composed of the members of our department. Uh, just about everybody was involved. And everybody slotted in when we came to the part of the operation where they were the world expert. And we were literally 10 hours ahead of schedule by doing it that way. And, and what that really points out is the incredible strength that can be derived when you have general excellence that is 
That is their help. There's nothing more important than that. And it doesn't have to be a newsworthy case because it's newsworthy for that patient. It's newsworthy for that family. And I get asked the question all the time, what's the most memorable case you've ever done? And I always say, that's easy. This is the last case that I just did. And it's always memorable when you get to go out and you get to tell that family that their loved one operation was a success and they did doing well. And there is nothing in the world that is better than that feeling. And those of us who are surgeons, you know, we get a lot of credit for what we do, but I just want to point out the fact that none of us operates in isolation. There's always a whole team of people without whom we could not do what we do. We could not do what we do here at Johns Hopkins without the nurses, the technicians, the administrators, all the people who have a single focus, and that is providing the best care possible for people. And, you know, I hope I continue to have a long life, have an opportunity to do many things. And I, you know, last month my wife and I had an opportunity to go to New Zealand. And what a thrill it was to walk into the, the largest venue that they have in the country and have it filled with thousands of kids who were cheering and just, you know, yelling my name. But they were so enamored with the story. And uh, in two, less than two months, we go to South Africa to do the dedication of a medical school that's uh, been named after me. And we were recently in Detroit for the inauguration of a high school named after me. And next month, I'll be in Atlanta to give the commencement at Emory.